Why, hello, everyone. It's me, Nathan. What's that? Reckless Attack is here in your feed on a Thursday? That's right. I am so, so excited to announce a new project that we have been thrilled about ever since we had a podcast and started looking for new cool ways to put out more content and support more people in the tabletop role-playing game community. As you might be able to tell from the title of this episode, this is Reckless A Talk, which is first and foremost a very fun pun that we are very pleased with, and second, a new interview series hosted here in our main feed, highlighting first members of the Reckless Attack cast and soon more creators, designers, podcasters, streamers, and more in the TTRPG space. I have had a lot of experience over the years being a professional interviewer, and it's something I really love to do. I love talking to people. I love hearing their stories. I love giving them a chance to essentially have the spotlight put on them and show off all the cool ways that they are cool. So like I said, we are starting with conversations between myself and the rest of the Reckless Attack crew, so you can get a better idea of who we are and the conversational style of these interviews. We are starting with Jonathan, the love lovely checkers player the um the lovely play the hmm, the player of checker the person who uh, you guys you guys get it uh we touched on so many amazing things uh, about designing checkers how he got into tabletop role playing games his perspectives his opinions uh really a lot of stuff that i found very powerful and meaningful and i hope you guys will too we really and we really hope we really hope that you enjoy this look, not just into the people we feature here's work, but also their perspectives and personalities. We hope it proves popular and something we can continue doing indefinitely. So if you enjoy it or have a suggestion for a future guest, please reach out to us on Twitter at reckless underscore attack or send us an email at recklessattack.contact at gmail.com. That is enough from me here in the preamble. Here, without any further ado, is my interview with Jonathan, a.k.a. Checkers, a.k.a. Frogstacks. Enjoy, and see you on Tuesday. Hello, Jonathan. Hi, Nathan. Hi. Uh, this is this is very interesting. Just recording and only us talking. I know. <laughs> um, I'm usually used to the energy of uh, roughly three more people and maybe another dog in right. the room yep. as yep. we're doing this. Uh, but thank you all for joining Jonathan and myself here. This is our first ever. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, one on one behind the screen interview. Um, so we we when we started our podcast, it was really important to us to be to be creators who lift up other creators for sure and and who wanted to engage with the community and show everyone all the cool stuff that's out there uh in no small part because we get inspired by a lot of it we like using a lot of it you know all that kind of stuff (laughs) and we want to show people the cool stuff yes Uh, but also because because you know asking questions uh, kind of building building those connections of getting the different perspectives, I know at least for me, has almost always been a source of growth, mm-hmm. a source of cool challenging of ideas, opinions of of prejudices even mm-hmm. um, or even just expanding your your worldview your right mind, and your yeah. mind and yeah. and and that kind of stuff and and it's valuable for us in a selfish way, but <laughs> yeah. also we hope very valuable for for our listeners just to get to you know, essentially pick the brains of uh, some of our favorite people in the TTRPG space. So uh, we are starting these interviews with our cast members uh, just so you get to know us a little bit better. Uh, but again, we're really hoping one day to uh, start branching out, uh, tapping some some hopefully new faces, some old friends, that kind of stuff. Uh, people in our lives, maybe, mm-hmm. uh, who've made an impact uh, just because we think that's a very cool, neat thing to do. Um, and Jonathan has drawn the short straw uh, yeah. as the first up. I purposely drew the short straw just so, just so I could kind of get into this first and feel good about it. 
and sort of pave the way for all the future interviews for both ourselves and for other people too. It's so. very, very brave, of, very, very brave and noble and hubristic of you. Where it's yeah. like, I'll set the tone, right? Yeah. I'll step in. Mm-hmm. It'll be great, uh-huh. and then everyone will be able to see, like, right. oh wow, if everything's as good as Jonathan's yeah. interview, they'll listen to it and say, this is exactly how you're supposed to do it. Yeah, exactly. It's uh-huh. Here, you listen. Listen to this interview first, mm-hmm. future guests, right? And then you'll know mm-hmm. kind of the standard that we hold ourselves and specifically you up to yes. and it's Jonathan. Yes. Um so the the goal of this is and Jonathan and I have, have, have certainly talked a lot about this is is a we want to be very conversational. This mm-hmm. is just two two people at least in this context. I'm sure eventually there'll be be larger groups that we're talking to but sure. just the two of us chatting. Mm-hmm. Um a lot of it's certainly going to be D&D gaming, TTRPG, fantasy, whatever focused. Um, but also it might just be learning more about the person oh, yeah. uh, who's, you know, who's kind of sitting across from us. Um, just because I, I think that there's a lot of value in knowing the humanity mm-hmm. of the person creating, mm-hmm. right? right? Um, for a zillion reasons. But, um, I don't want to start with this particular interview in kind of the personal sphere, um, what I want to start with, uh, and this was not on the prepared list of questions, Jonathan, oh, no. so I'm already <laughs> throwing you a curveball. First, I just wanted, I wanted to, I wanted to ask this question. Mm-hmm. Did you know mm-hmm. that you are one of my favorite DMs I've ever played with, played for? I did not know that, but that is absolutely lovely, and I really appreciate that. It is true. Yeah, uh, I am a, mostly a forever DM, yeah, so I don't, right. uh, you know, I don't mean to put any grains of salt in in that compliment. Uh-huh. Um, but but I have played with a good handful. Um, certainly played with enough to have opinions on multiple. Sure. Uh, and I have had not great DMs, okay. and I have had some yeah. middling DMs, uh, mm-hmm. and I've had some DMs who were not to my taste, mm-hmm. um, but were still great DMs. Mm-hmm. Um, but I I have played in one short little campaign mm-hmm. of yours, and I've played in a handful, what, like two one-shots? Probably, yeah. I think something like that. A few. Um, and, and every time that I've played with you, I have, I have been like wowed Yay. at the at your style um and and anyone who <laughs> anyone who's listening who's who maybe has run games or whatever mm-hmm. uh, or just or just played with a bunch of people i don't know if you guys have ever gotten the feeling that you're watching someone and it's it's so totally different than mm-hmm. what you're doing mm-hmm it's not wrong, but mm-hmm. it's just like this whole other space, yeah, that right. and whole other vibe that that you don't think of at mm-hmm. least knowingly, mm-hmm. or you don't hit at all. Um, sure. And I think you, in a lot of ways, are that DM for me. Nice the way you plan stuff, and you know, not over plan, but mm-hmm. but have a clear structure in mind. A lot of times, mm-hmm. uh, the amount of work you do into your NPC stuff, mm-hmm. uh, your combats are always. I, I will literally always feel worse about the combats <laughs> that I run um, because of how tactical you are as a player and DM. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I always am like, uh, but Jonathan would have run something different. <laughs> um, not not exclusively right. you, but plenty. You right. you are among the people where it's like, uh, if I was a better DM or a different DM, mm-hmm. I would have run a more complex, more <laughs> three dimensional, <laughs> no, four dimensional no, combat. Right. Let's include time. Well, I really appreciate that, Nathan. And I want to say that I also consider you to be one of those gems I look to when I say, oh, here's someone who's doing something different, but also very, very good. So I'm glad that we kind of, I think we have two different perspectives on how we run games. Yeah. And both are very good and both are very valid. But I, I just, I like hearing that from you because i also kind of see i i treat you the same way that you're you're talking about me right now of like you are a dm that i think is really very good at very a, a lot of, at a lot of things and when i play in your games i'm always just very excited and very happy to be there so um so so i have a lot of stuff that i want to want to talk to you about about mm-hmm. your experience in the genre about your uh you know about your your perspective as a player Mm -hmm. about checkers about everything (laughs) um but but yeah i I guess kind of where i wanted to start and it's not even really at the beginning but i feel like is kind of a a quintessential thematic question for this conversation all right 
when when you sit down to play, to run, to write uh-huh. a and d or yeah. tabletop RPG adventure, because you've played a, a good amount, yeah. not like a huge, because again, we play D&D all the time. Yes. So that, uh-huh. that eats up a lot of our, our kind of budget yep. uh, for the week. But yep. um, when when you sit down and are, are creating something mm-hmm. and are thinking about what's important for you sure and maybe it's different as a player as a as a dm uh-huh. but what are kind of the things that you turn to to tabletop role playing games yeah to kind of accomplish to feel to explore um as as you're kind of again sitting down to think about it and get prepared sure. uh, for something new sure okay that is a good question it's a very broad question yes and the first thing i think about because I've run a decent chunk of games. Yeah. And one of the things that I always think about is, does this make sense? Like, <laughs> yep. it doesn't have to be realistic Absolutely. necessarily, but it, to me, it has to make some kind of logical sense yep. in order to portray it ter- correctly to the players. So when I'm planning like a dungeon or something, I always think about, do these rooms kind of make sense? Yeah. You know, does the, is the space where the kitchen goes, does it have like these extra little things that I think it should have because it's in a goblin layer or something? So I typically try to make sure that the maps make sense, the sort of plot makes sense, mm-hmm. at least in my head. It doesn't always translate well, super well. <laughs> right. You got to be able to yeah. fool yourself first, though. Right. Right. Yeah. right. Exactly. So like, I think a good example of this was um, when I was running a Call of Cthulhu game and I introduced sort of like this character moment where the players had an NPC that was traveling with them. And all of them got sent back in time to like right. this sort of yes, like time, about time loop little bit. sort of thing. Yeah. And they solved the problem. They completed the, the encounter and the NPC, the NPC that they traveled with did not go back, come back with them. They went to a different time. So it really kind of took me a while to figure out, okay, well, this NPC went back to this different time in this different timeline. How were they affected by that? What were they doing? And when they get reintroduced to the party... How do they act? How do they behave? What do they experience that's yeah. different from the NPC, from the party? So I think that was kind of an interesting, cool thing for me because yeah. it really played into a lot of the character. And I played the character very differently when they finally came back to meet the party because I basically was playing two characters mm-hmm. under the same character. It was like, here's oh, a person cool. from this timeline. Here's how they act. And then they switch to here's the person from the other timeline. Here's how they act. Here's mm-hmm. their experiences. And it was just, it was a really cool thing, but it took me a long time to think about what did this person experience while they were in a different time. And that's, and that being, being an em- emblematic mm-hmm. of the type of approaches that you have of yeah. like, and I definitely noticed that as a, as a DM, having mm-hmm. seen kind of behind this, the scenes of you, you talking about checkers, certainly, yeah. mm-hmm. um, especially checkers. Cause we yeah. were, we <laughs> checkers was a much more exhaustive yeah. construction process yeah. than most other D and D characters. Sure. Cause it's for a podcast. Yes. Um, but yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, be- that, that is also something that I really, mm-hmm. uh, is important to me. Right. Um, right. and also why I obsessively world build in the background is cause it's yeah. like, no, I need to know all of this yeah. to an extent, for sure. uh, to, or at least the feel so that mm-hmm. I can then improvise mm-hmm. from there. Mm-hmm. This needs to make sense to me so mm-hmm. I can make it make sense to them. Right. Um, is also very important to me, certainly. So. Mm-hmm. Is that just something that you have to have basically that you have to kind of root yourself in before proceeding? Or is that something almost uh, philosophical that that you kind of put forward where you're like, I, I it is important for me mm-hmm. to create an experience for them mm-hmm. that is believable? Or is it just like my brain needs this yeah. to 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 be able to have any semblance of confidence for running. Right. I think it's more of just my brain needs this yeah. so that I can have a foundation and build off of it. Like the players will only ever see a small part of what I've thought through and what I've created. So and also on top of that, like we're playing in a fantasy world where things sometimes can just be answered by its magic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And maybe should be answered yeah, by right. it, that it's magic. Exactly. But in order for me to have an understanding of like how things operate when the players aren't there or how things got to this point. I typically need to think through what are some of the logical steps that led to this. Yeah. So especially like, you know, if you're building like a, a faction based world where three factions are interacting with each other, which is, this is something that I've done before, you know, what are the leaders of the factions thinking? What are their side, you know, what are their helpers thinking? Where are they living that caused them to think this way? Yes. That kind of stuff. And how do they present themselves to the party in a way that, 
is interesting and helps the party make choices. So I just think it's helpful for me to think through all that partially to create the foundation, but also because that's just kind of how I operate. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. yeah, totally. Um, well, then at that, we will take the kind of fuller step sure. back, uh, <laughs> yeah. not quite to the, uh, so I was born, uh-huh. uh, you know, back mm-hmm. in yada, yada. Mm-hmm. But um, ever since I met you, mm-hmm. um, you Dave, you and David especially, but I think by by the time I met you guys, you, David, and Sophie yeah. had already been playing tabletop games for a bit yeah. um for for yeah for at least a, a hunk of time before mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. Uh, so i i have only known david and jonathan <laughs> as people who play tabletop role-playing yes, games right primarily um, that's and, how we met and, and and that's also how we spend most of our time together because yeah. D takes a lot of time <laughs> uh-huh. right but um, it's also just a fun group activity that, yes. that lets me socialize with yeah people. exactly so what do you remember mm-hmm. what your first exposure to to tabletop role-playing games kind of specifically was yeah. um, and or fantasy as kind of a genre. Right. Um, but yeah, so I, I, it's, it's always so interesting that like what that spark was yeah. where you realize like, wait a second, this is a thing <laughs> yeah. that exists that that I can do right now Right. Um, is always such a cool origin story and sometimes very telling. So yeah, I, I would love to hear about how you guys got kind of introduced. Yeah. So there's kind of two separate answers to this. I'll start with the the first one, which is probably when I was like seven or eight years old. But I used to go to the local library and just kind of look at books and see cool things. And I distinctly remember when I was little finding some of the old like, I don't know if they were like second edition or third edition, like Dungeons and Dragons modules, like those big campaigns they would put out yeah and just sitting down and just reading through them and seeing all the cool like if the party does this thing they find this monster or they like go interact with this npc in this way and like here's how the world reacts to that and just sort of reading through it and being like utterly fascinated by those books and even now a lot of those big campaign modules are intended to be read like you know front to back almost like a like a novel yeah especially the older ones yeah. are dense <laughs> right right but like that was just fascinating to me so i i used to read a lot of those and just go to the library sit down and just read for a whole afternoon and learn about all the cool like the lich and the tower does this and here's his plan and here's what the party needs to do in order to stop him that kind of stuff that, so that's awesome yeah and that's uh, that's also a i i love those stories like mm-hmm. one of my favorite uh, uh, tropes mm-hmm. of of origin stories yeah. is is kids who wander into a comic store yeah. or library or bookshop right. and discover some piece of of ephemera uh-huh. and then are <laughs> obsessed with it yeah. and have nothing no outlet yeah. <laughs> for yeah. that information. Uh, Steve, uh, I think he talked a little bit about maybe getting some of that where yep. like he he mm-hmm. I think got a monster manual mm-hmm. uh, that's like the go to. Yep. Uh, not cliche, but the a very common one where yeah. you just open it up and you're like, "Holy shit! <laughs> what are all these monsters? Yep. I love them." Yep. Um, but it's interesting. What really jumps out at me mm-hmm. is that is that your exposure was not monster manual type right. stuff. Right. It was set. You know, setting books, and uh-huh. it was campaigns, mm-hmm. and it was the story, and it was the the sometimes very practical mm-hmm. application right. of the cool pictures and monsters. Yep. Yep. <laughs> uh, and because like you said, it, it, it's not always, it's written often to be functional, right? Yeah, is that there right. is story to it and there is that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. but it's, a resource, right? right? Uh, it's not it. designed to be a book. A lot of people do it. I've read lots of adventures, lots of, of mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. So what, what, what captured you? about those other than just like oh it's a weird cool different thing but what what kind of really lit that spark for you yeah i think i think a lot of it now that i'm now that i'm thinking about it was probably the sort of part of it was the adventure Mm -hmm. of it of here's this grand because this was like a small town of like twenty thousand people you know there wasn't a lot going on besides cornfields (laughs) not a lot of adventure yeah so the adventure part of it just seeing into this different world through the actions of a party was cool but i think a lot of it was also just being able to make your own decisions and have that impact the world. Yeah. Like I'm also remembering really loving those choose your own adventure books Yeah, and definitely. just like flipping through the pages and going like, Oh, Hey, here's what happens if I make this decision and you go, Oh, but I didn't want to make that decision. Actually, I'm going <laughs> to go, go back. Let's <laughs> get to that. Same I didn't read point. it. I didn't yep. read it I, that much. I just, you know, I saw it for a second. I'm good. I'm going to go back. So I think really a lot of it was just understanding that I could make choices in a world and have that impact things around me. And just like seeing that in book form was, you know, again, this, I was little at this time. So right. it's kind of one of those first exposures of, oh, hey, this is a cool thing. And making a choice as a party or as a person in a fantasy world does cause things to happen, different things to happen. That was that was cool. 
Yeah, that's I love those little moments mm -hmm. of again of realizing that there is this whole other way of thinking mm -hmm. or of living. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right. in a lot of ways, exactly is so is so wonderful mm -hmm. and and. Uh, you know, people, I feel like a lot of people can really point mm -hmm. to a few of those moments in their lives yep. where it defined a lot right. moving forward. Um, so it's always cool to be able to explore that. So kind of moving from that mm -hmm. where you're just, you know, reading, you know, stat blocks <laughs> yeah. and, uh, flavor text mm -hmm. and, and that sort of thing, you know, kind of through, through your life, what are, what were the kind of stories uh, it can be thematically or mm. specific titles too. Sure. But what were the kind of stories beyond just that which you read yeah. uh, on bookshelves that yeah. were, uh, you know, adventure paths? Yeah, yeah. What were the ones that that stuck out to you or that you remember really clicked with clicked for you as a as a kid? Hmm, that is a great question because, or as an adult, right. I read a lot of stuff that I <laughs> connect with deeply right yeah. now. Right, like as a child, I don't know that I necessarily read a lot that yeah. was in the fantasy genre. Oh yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> no, and it wouldn't even need. I, I don't even mean the fantasy genre. Yeah. I mean any property. There are certainly a lot of stories that you can tell in the fantasy genre that work best in the fantasy genre or themes to explore. But sure. also, like it is for a lot of places, just a window dressing. Right, we're yeah. like, what's at the core of it? it uh -huh. You know, it can be. What's at the core of a fantasy novel a lot of times can be explored in a lot of different ways. So sure, it's sure. it's whatever you thought was cool. <laughs> yeah. And I'm trying to think about it because that is a question that has not come up for me before. Um, I'm just thinking like, you know, as an adult, I read a lot of fantasy novels. Yeah. Or it can be shows. It can be mm -hmm. movies. It can mm -hmm. be whatever media was like spoke to you or resonated with you. And if there wasn't really any, then I think that's equally valid. Yeah. I don't know if there was anything specifically mm -hmm. that really spoke to me back then. I just remember really being into Dungeons and Dragons specifically and <laughs> wanting to play Dungeons and Dragons and not really getting to. Yeah, I was going to ask, yeah. did you did you ever get to? And yeah. and also for for listeners, I don't know if, how much we have ever actually said on the podcast. David and Jonathan are brothers. Yes. <laughs> they are twins. Yes. Uh, therefore, there was a natural potential person to be exploring these things mm -hmm. with. So, so A, did David share this kind of interest or this reading of these things or of D&D &D or of kind of your desire to do that? Uh -huh. Or like, what was that dynamic like specifically in this kind of uh, exploration and, and purview? Sure. Yeah. So... Both of us, I think, have been in, into this kind of Dungeons and Dragons and a fantasy for most of our lives. And it was actually my brother who first got me into a situation where we could actually play Dungeons and Dragons for real. Mm -hmm. But we first started at least, you know, really legitimately playing Dungeons and Dragons back in college, actually, because he had found a local game store that was running Pathfinder. Ah, uh, yes. On uh, at, you know Monday nights, they were doing Pathfinder Society, and he found out about it our roommate wanted to go so we all the three of us my brother and i and our roommate just all decided to go to that game shop and try it out and play it for an evening so both of us have both i've always been interested in it and i think it's just sort of a shared interest we have and continue to have but that was kind of the start of when we first started you know actually rolling actually dice playing, yeah. and making character <laughs> sheets and like hey I, you know i'm the wizard or whatever but before then, it was just like a, a pipe dream of, oh, I really want to do this, and it's cool, but I don't know that I'll ever really have the chance to do it. Yeah. When, was that the Dice Dojo? Yeah, that, that was you the went Dice Dojo to? here in Chicago, yeah. I am, am truly tickled, and we'll get into it more at some of our other episodes, uh, especially the Steve episode, mm -hmm. but am truly tickled mm -hmm. at how central yeah. that local friendly gaming show store yeah. is to our origin story uh -huh. <laughs> but not but not in the way that you'd expect yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is a zany time uh, again we'll go into it more but but essentially the the short story is that each of us has essentially interacted with each other uh -huh. at that particular gaming store in that particular spot in Chicago yeah. dating back years yeah like like a, a decade a decade at this point yeah right. um and just weird paths crossing and all kinds of stuff that mm -hmm. only barely had to do with the <laughs> fact that we are all in a DD podcast together now yeah. uh, and it is a story for for whenever steve's episode is going to come around mm -hmm. um but it is hilarious, fascinating hilarious it is story. crazy um so 
you started with Pathfinder, yes. right? Was your that's, first system. That's correct. Um, but I know you've at least dabbled in several other ones. Uh-huh. So so what what other game systems, and not as a like measuring stick, yeah. obviously, but just <laughs> out of my own curiosity, what other, other systems have yeah. you played in and or run just yeah. in terms of tabletop sure. role-playing games because then I know board games is like yeah. a whole, whole separate thing. other thing. It's like, oh, you like role-playing games? Well, name every role-playing yeah, game. Yeah, right. I was going to say, like, let's, <laughs> let's, you know, hey, yeah. listener, you know, disclaimer, hopefully if you're listening to this, you're not one of these people, but, you know, if if you if you view this as some sort of a litmus test uh-huh. or measuring stick, you can you can just get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what we're talking about. Right. Um, compar- comparatively, Little, I think, but also compared to Steve, I haven't run that many. Um, I that's true. Pathfinder is a big one. Call of Cthulhu, I've done a lot of that, if, if only because a friend of mine really likes Call of Cthulhu. He ran a game, and then I ran the next game, and it was just a lot of fun to play and run it. Um, Numenera is a big one. I'm a big fan of that system, if only because right. I, as a DM, don't actually have to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> I can just like sit here and make up the story and have the players roll for their own thing. But also, the, I think I just think the the system's cool, the world's cool. Um, I remember you guys specifically trying to sell me on yeah, Numenera for yeah, yeah. A, a portion of time yeah. early on when we started playing. Uh-huh, and then uh-huh. we all just kind of were like, oh, but like, we should just keep playing D&D, yeah, right? right. Yeah, no, but sure. <laughs> it was very sure. funny. And it's, it's interesting, too, because I actually got sold on Numenera at the Dice Dojo because someone was there showing off the system. And I'm like, oh, cool, what is this? So um, it all leads back to the it Dice Dojo. It all leads back. Right. Hey, Dice Dojo, if you're listening. Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> if you, I think there's still I think there's still a thing, right? Yeah, at least in so. the year 2021. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But if you're listening, sponsorship opportunities are available. Right. Um, go ahead. Yeah, but I think the main ones that I've run are Pathfinder, Dungeons & Dragons, Call of Cthulhu, and... I've dabbled a bit here and there with other smaller systems, like those sort of you know one page RPGs yeah. oh, yeah, for like one shot sort of things, and those are always fun. But I think if I had to just pick on the big systems, it yeah. would be Call of Cthulhu, Pathfinder, and Dungeons and Dragons. Is there a is there a system that you that you haven't been able to try mm-hmm. or haven't really been able to at least get your kind of teeth into sure. that you'd really like to? Yeah, I think for me, the one I'm thinking of right now is is the uh, Pathfinder Second Edition. Yeah, if only because I, I played Pathfinder when it you know, in the first couple of years when it came out and was around Pathfinder for a few years and then, you know, kind of dropped off when we switched over to 5e and Pathfinder 2 came out and it was just like, here's all these cool things. Here's yeah. all these ways to, you know, make your actions cool. And like, it was just very different from Definitely. how original Pathfinder was, but also anything that I had really seen or heard of before. So it's one of those things where it's, it's crunchy enough to be a little bit of a barrier sometimes. So it's like, it's hard to find a group of people necessarily to just like jump in and learn all the rules and play the game. Yeah. And, and, and we had even briefly entertained jumping over right. to, to 2E because, right. especially because I think we would have had, we have fun playing pretty much any system yeah, eventually, or sure. we will hack it to pieces until we do have fun. Yes. Um, but, but, you know, especially knowing, um, knowing you and you and David, mm-hmm. uh, and even I think to a lesser extent, Sophie and Steve mm-hmm. kind of would appreciate the level of kind of customization and stuff mm-hmm. that goes into it. Yeah. Um, but also because it was a podcast, we didn't want to get the rules wrong. Yes. And, <laughs> and I would get many rules. And wrong I know I would that. get many rules wrong and not that it is an impenetrable system, yeah. but definitely is a system that I, I mix up a lot uh-huh. because I've played so much D and D and it's just different enough that right. I would be wrong and I don't it's not fun radio to sure. hear people be wrong be about wrong all the time. stuff right exactly. um, but hey let, write in now listeners if you want to uh, do some bonus Pathfinder 2E content yeah. um, you can uh, subscribe to our Patreon and get a lot of other people <laughs> to subscribe to our Patreon and then maybe yeah. we'll do yeah, it maybe we'll think about it but I, I think that's the big system that I've wanted to try and just haven't really had a chance to try which is fine I mean that's always going to happen yeah so so of our conversations you me and David a mm-hmm. uh, third is is D&D yeah. RPG right a uh, third is just kind of, you know, general, whatever, yeah. friend stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then another third is just random anime nonsense yeah. and, and movies <laughs> anime, anime and, and whatever, whatever, yeah. you know, uh, pop culture ephemera uh-huh. that yeah. we're all like, hey, did you see this? This is <laughs> yeah. good. I think you really like this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's it's all all of it is beautiful and perfect. Uh-huh. Um, but but. Is there anything in in any stories again? And it could be it can be an anime, it can uh-huh. be a show, it can be oh this adventure or this campaign that we've that I've run uh-huh. or whatever. Right? Are there is there anything either in creation of the adventure mm-hmm. or in a creation of a character in it or whatever, mm-hmm. um, or of course of watching something? Sure, sure. Are there again? Are there themes or are there uh, tones 
or anything like that that you have ever noticed where it's like, ah, hold on. I realize I really like uh, aspirational things or I like things where heroes win or I like... Uh, you know, I like to watch my heroes <laughs> ground into yeah. a fine paste right. and barely able to eke out the other side. And uh-huh. that is crack to me. Yeah. Um, is yeah. there anything like that for, for you? I think uh, now that you mention, I think I tend towards more of the, you know, heroes save the day, the you yeah. know, and be the villains, that kind of stuff. I don't necessarily like more of that, like grim, dark, gritty. Oh, the hero has to fight for every yeah. single last thing, and like just in some of the media that I've consumed and like the content that I've listened to and read, I generally just make. Sh- I I just really enjoy like those feel good stories of yeah. when everyone's just having a good time and like yeah, there's conflict and everything, but you know that the hero is going to win in, in at the end and just you know come out victorious, and that's just that's just the kind of stuff that I like. Um, and then just in terms of like, I shouldn't know where I was going with that, but that's, that. I think that's the general theme of yeah, like what totally. I like and then the kind of games that I run, like I'm going to make them challenging, but I'm not going to like try and grind you into the dust, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that's been always a very pleasant experience with our gaming group mm-hmm. is, is I, it, I, I feel like that has always been semi agreed upon, mm-hmm. um, and and it is of course very important to have those session zeros with people to be, agree upon tone, agree yeah. on that p- kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And for us, we had a very backwards introduction into <laughs> us creating a campaign, which again I think we'll get into in a future interview. Maybe for my yeah, interview, we don't sure. know, but yeah. I I I am kind of astonished at how how much we share. Oh yeah, as a group mm-hmm. that sensibility it where it's r- like make us feel pain uh-huh you know hurt our souls and uh-huh. spirits uh but also we want to be good guys yeah. and we want to save the world uh-huh. and we want to make friends right. and we want to support each other and mm-hmm. we want to like you know have our our shonen arcs yeah and exactly. and you know that kind of stuff where again mm-hmm. we make us feel feelings mm-hmm. but also we like when the heroes <laughs> yes, win, win. Yeah. and it's satisfying mm-hmm. um and mm-hmm. i think that's that's always been a lovely um a lovely kind of just shared experience that we're all yeah, we pretty have, much uniformly looking for. We I have think. a great group in terms of that. Like we've all kind of yeah. centralized around how we act and how we want the stories to go. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. And, and you know, that, that to me, it's kind of that double edged sword of having a set gaming group, right. Yeah. <laughs> where like, where, where there are a lot of different perspectives and different ways to play and a lot of very valid and valuable stories right. outside of that, mm-hmm. um, which is also what I'm hoping to get at for these interviews long sure. term. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also it's, it's also just nice to have, yeah. uh, to have be like, Hey, so we all want to tell these stories. Right. And yeah. like I, I as DM have a set scope uh-huh. where it's like, I, I know what a reckless attack adventure is. Yes. And I know what an adventure that my players are going to like is. And mm-hmm. like, Obviously, I, I put some thought into it, and we have some safety tools in place. Yes. And if there's ever any any questions or worries that I have, uh, mm-hmm. I will voice it. Right. Um, but also, I have at this point a pretty good sense of like, ooh, here's what <laughs> here's what they're gonna like. Yeah, they're gonna have fun with this, and one. they're gonna have fun with it. And again, even in the the scariest or the darkest or the weirdest mm-hmm. or whatever, is that like. On the other side, we will all again not to be too hubristic. I want to <laughs> knock on wood. I don't want to. I don't want this to be like. And then cut to six episodes later. Yeah, right. <laughs> gaming group is disbanded. Uh-huh. Um, oh, but no. I feel like we're all pretty much on the same page, or right. at least, and and we trust each other to get oh, yeah. to get to that point where right. like you guys know that I also want you to win. Right. <laughs> I yes. also want yeah. you to have that triumphant hero moment. Yep. And also, uh, we also all know that. If that doesn't happen, mm-hmm. then that doesn't mean it's forever. Right. It's not never going to happen. It's just we're in the middle of the story for right exactly. now. Exactly. And and oops, what we thought was the end of the story with the heroic moment yeah. w- was not. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> yeah. But that just means it's actually Empire Strikes Back and right. not Return of the Jedi. And we'll we'll get there. Don't sure. worry about it. Yep. Yep. Um, so to piggyback off of, off of that question, mm-hmm. and it's very interesting that you say that. Uh-huh. Uh, because checkers yeah is right. not that no necessarily. He's not. at he's least not. at least at least on face value sure um or even face and like a couple inches skin deep <laughs> is not that yeah um so so not just to talk about checkers specifically yeah um and i do want to but we will we'll build to it <laughs> yeah, yeah is we'll the way it. i want to say it uh-huh. 
can you talk me through a little bit yeah. uh, when you're sitting down to create a character? Uh-huh. Um, and I know that's a little bit of a complicated question and uh-huh. a lot of variables. Yeah. But but how do you go about doing it? Um, especially we'll just limit it to to D and D, I guess. Yeah. Um, if that's useful. Yeah. Um, well, that I really hit a an octave <laughs> useful. Yeah. Uh, if that's useful. Yeah. Um, but otherwise you know, kind of uh, free reign. But yeah, yeah. so so uh, as someone who creates a lot of really great characters, uh-huh. what is your process for kind of doing that? Sure, absolutely. So this kind of speaks to how I, how I have played Dungeons & Dragons in the past and how I have changed mm-hmm. as a player as we've gone and as I've played with this group. Because in Pathfinder, and my brother will probably also talk about this, but <laughs> we started off with Pathfinder Society. And Pathfinder Society, for those of you who don't know, is the organized play for Pathfinder. Right. People come in with their characters, they sit down for three to four hours, they play, you know, a very specific module, and they get gear and loot, at, and, it, you know, it comes out of that, and their characters get stronger and whatnot. But it's a very different experience from when you're playing a home game, yeah. in that there is a lot of emphasis on the individual and not so much on the group. Like, for me, Growing playing in that environment taught me that it was cool when I succeeded and, and I was the best person there. Yep. And yep. it didn't really matter what everyone else is doing because I wasn't going to see them again anyway. Right. Totally. I just, I just needed to succeed at this module and have the magic items for my character. Yeah. And it, and it was it, like you said, it was really it's as I recall and understand it's built for that where there's yeah. specific goals yeah. for your factions or whatever right, that exactly. there's built in ways for you to specifically succeed yep. in addition to succeeding in in completing the adventure right right and maybe this what this isn't necessarily the goal of pathfinder Society, yeah, right. but like i from my first experience and having played a little bit of it that felt like that's what i got out of it right exactly what what was intended yeah. and what college jonathan yeah glommed onto yeah. could be very different yeah. yes yep so i grew up essentially as a as like a power gamer of like i need my character to have Ugh. the strongest things that i can make it and my fear coming out of that was a like multi-class <laughs> wizard slash cleric pretty but, sure i know exactly what character you're about yeah, to say but i'm right. excited for you to talk about and it. it was it was cool because i had set it up in a way where they essentially had full spell progression for both wizard and cleric like you know for a D character if you were a 15th level character What's what's the best way to say this? If you were so so, the difference being if you're a multi class character in five e, yeah, uh, you would only get the benefits more or less. I mean, you guys get it. You're savvy mm-hmm. enough, hopefully. Right. Uh, but you know, if you went nine levels in cleric and six levels in wizard, right. you get bits and bobbles of both. Yeah. You don't get the full kind of power of a fifteenth level right. character in that in those terms. Right. You'd have you'd have the spell slots of a fifteenth level character, and you'd be able to cast spells of like the ninth level wizard and the sixth level sorcerer. But my character in Pathfinder was set up in such a way that I would have both the spell slots of the 15th level wizard and the 15th level cleric and have full access to both sides and be able so, to do literally it, everything literally all of those things so i would have you know essentially twice as many spell slots twice as many access to spells and i essentially just played this like god wizard cleric who just sort of controlled the battlefield and <laughs> did, did whatever yeah, he wanted I did exa- yeah exactly i think his like his signature spell back then was a dazing ball lightning which was basically you know the meta magic for dazing basically you had to make the save on the spell or you were just essentially stunned for a round and ball lightning was a spell that essentially conjured up four different ball lightnings and you would just Aha. send them all at the I same see the synergy thing. yeah at the same thing <laughs> And they would have to make four or five separate saves or just be stunned. Against your full yeah. save progression right. DC exactly. that had not been nerfed at all. Right. And not not changed in the slightest. Like very powerful wizard just like annihilating this one thing. And I remember distinctly I won quote unquote won. <laughs> there was a big bad that, you know, the party was really struggling with. And I hadn't done, you know, I hadn't th- busted this out yet. But you know, as soon as I saw that the party was, you know, really having some struggles, I threw out the dazing ball lightning, forced the monster to make the save. It failed, and I just kept doing that until we were able to until beat you it. won. <laughs> yeah, and you know, someone made the comment afterwards of like, I don't know if we would have been able to done that if my character hadn't wasn't there. Like, yeah, we would have all just died. And I'm like, okay, well, I feel good because yeah, I was gonna <laughs> say that would be very satisfying. Right, exactly. But I can also understand how like just beating the boss and forcing it to do nothing for the whole evening is not exactly a fun way to spend your time. Yeah. So, but that's, I digress. That kind of feeds into how I kind of play my characters these days, which is I start off with something that I consider powerful. So checkers as a character, I started off with 
the intention to go crossbow expert sharpshooter because in Dungeons and Dragons, that's kind of like one of those common things that you do when you want to be a powerful character is you take crossbow expert sharpshooter. Yeah, exactly. You do a lot of damage. You yeah, it's all good. And then yeah. I ruined all those plans. Oh yeah, for sure. And but he started off as a as a mounted crossbow shooter who would just run around the battlefield as a as a mounted archer, sharpshoot things, and then just you know be good at doing damage, doing yeah. range damage. Um, and then over time. So I typically start with like those large power concepts of like what do I want to do, and I also typically just play like wizards and druids and caster. Yep, classes. you're definitely a spellcaster right. leaning person. Yeah, you right. like the options. It right. always seems to me, and you like being able to solve a lot of different problems. Right, exactly. Like if I play a martial class, it's typically like a, a martial plus a caster kind of thing. Right. I typically don't play like you know just martial characters. So I start with that, and then I'll typically build around that character of how do I justify this character having these kinds of things like i'll i'll create a backstory and i'll create a situation that would have led to this of how did my crossbow sharpshooter come about right and how do i justify their character class and their choices and everything and i'll build the i'll build the story and the character around that mm -hmm. but at that core i know there is a character that i will like to play mechanically and yes. that will make sense to me so that's typically how I go about building characters and going back to the checkers thing like yeah because then because yeah you know, again and and checkers being a specific, you know, again, specifically, again, I, I then was like, hey, what if we didn't play with feats and then yeah. did ruin that? Yeah, but, right. And like, um, that's fine. <laughs> but but yeah, so so that's clear with checkers where you had this idea and then mm -hmm. you would build around that. Yeah, right. Exactly. And for checkers, too, there were a couple. Again, we we had a lot of time to think about our characters. Thanks, COVID. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, COVID. And that we had planned this originally kind of late 2019 and then just had a lot of time to think about <laughs> it and talk about it. Really marinate. Yeah. Yep. And Nathan, you know, was changing some things around, too, like. You know, hey, I was really thinking about making making magic items more cool and removing feats, and like, okay, cool, that's great, but it also changes my character. Yeah, right. <laughs> and like, yeah. the you know the rules for floating a uh, number, like floating stat bonuses as a character came out then. So like, oh, I didn't have to play the character that w strictly got plus two decks. I could play whatever race I wanted, right. and then just put the plus two decks there. So a lot changed over the course of this, and I think some of the stuff that had changed as we were talking so there's like you know the, there's the checkers for a crossbow sharpshooter stuff there's right. the mango as a pet yes along with that yep. i think there a lot of stuff kind of changed around that too because checkers as a character i wanted him to have a pet yeah because it was just i needed something for the mountain archer part i needed right I needed exactly to mount. exactly that you had a you had that that clear right the vision of i want it to be a powerful archer character and i want it to be a mounted and right. within the confines of D, &D there's mm -hmm. a, a narrow spectrum of, of ways to do that right right exactly and i didn't want it to just be like here's a mount that i have for an hour a day it's like if i want if i'm gonna have a pet i want to have the pet you know have as a permanent thing yeah, as a feature right. as a as a defining part of of your character right right so the only thing that kind of fit into that was in terms of dungeons and dragons 5e we have the the drew or the uh, the ranger with the beast master and yep. like the paladin with the fine steed and there's some other options too now nowadays but like back then it was really primarily those two things. all those all those many months ago yeah, in 2019 yeah, exactly yeah. but it's like okay well i don't really want to play a paladin necessarily because i've played i've dabbled in paladins and i just i personally don't really like the i convert my spells to damage via smite yeah. mechanic and yeah. i want when i played a paladin i literally used all my spells for like actual spells and right just never smited <laughs> exactly yeah which is which is unsatisfying on both ends of the spectrum because right. so, you don't get a lot of casting and yeah. also you don't get to do any fun damage right exactly and ranger kind of falls in the same boat of like i don't really yeah. want to play a, a, a half caster i want to play a caster and then have the mount so nathan was generous enough to let me use a druid homebrew yeah that swapped out the wild shape and the subclass for essentially what was the beastmaster pet and back then it was sort of like this conglomeration of weird beastmaster stuff because a lot of people didn't really like the base beastmaster yeah right so everyone <laughs> this who, was at yeah. the like height of the like something needs to be done right right <laughs> fury around so, that class everyone has their own take on like what the ranger should be what the beastmaster should be and this individual who made the homebrew also had their own take on it so I went with that, and then as things progressed, we eventually swapped out that whole system for just the new updated Tasha's Beastmaster. So the final iteration of yeah. how Checkers ended up was a Druid, because I didn't want to play Ranger, but a Druid who swapped out all that stuff for the Tasha's Beastmaster. For the Mango. Beast. Yeah, for the Mango. And I 
like how it turned out because too. it fulfills a lot of the things that I was hoping for. It's like, here's the full spellcaster that I wanted. Here's the pet that I wanted. Here's a pet in a way that doesn't overshadow the myself or the rest of the party kind of yeah. thing. It's like a lot of the times when you get a pet based class, it's the pet that is the it's main the focus. Yeah. yeah. And then the, the character is just, oh, I stand back and cast spells at it. Or I have to... brought the pet yeah. to the fight. Right. What more do you want me to do? Yeah. It's like, I'm just going to go stand back because if anything gets close to me, I'll die. It's like, no, I didn't want to do that. So checkers ended up as like a, a a good solid character with a pet with all the abilities of like the mounting the spell casting like it all kind of worked together and it it yeah. all marinated for a while and came together with Nathan's help to this character that I actually really enjoy playing and then in terms of like how that personality came about yeah that 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 I'm also very, I mean I I love the characters that you mechanically built mm-hmm. a lot yeah um and I love the characters personality that you build a lot right. <laughs> uh, and so there it's it's very cool to have it be two equal parts where mm-hmm. like you you and and david does this very well too yeah, where it has a very clear mechanical build yeah. that, that you're interested in 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 playing because right. it's a game and yeah. that's uh, half the game is you yeah. gotta be able to be fun with that yeah. but also i think you guys both do a good job of layering a character on top of that mm-hmm. for for our listeners our last campaign mm-hmm. uh, our home campaign that was not uh not largely recorded we have fl- <laughs> we have them maybe floating around somewhere yeah um jonathan played one of the most do-getter characters possible oh yeah uh, he oh, yeah. was a bard he was just the the, the nicest child uh <laughs> he just wanted to feed everyone uh-huh. he was very very wholesome mm-hmm. everyone he was everyone's favorite boy mm-hmm. uh compared to david's uh <laughs> mega maniacal monster wizard right. uh who we also loved but uh-huh. for very different reasons very different reasons um yeah. and and checkers is not that yes um and is very different than a lot of the other characters i've ever seen you play or mm-hmm. even embody as npcs oh yeah um, um, and so I, yeah, I would love to also hear about, about not only, you know, kind of just like, oh yeah, frog man, uh-huh. riding a frog. Yeah. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but of the, of the specific kind of personality of checkers and the worldview and mindset of checkers, because it's a lot of people, um, I feel like a lot of people uh-huh. want to play cool, exotic races yeah. in D&D and like no duh like yeah. yep absolutely <laughs> hell yes yeah do it because like who doesn't want to play as a sexy tiefling or uh-huh. as a weird turtle guy yeah. or like Why absolutely or, or a cat person like yeah. all good hell yes mm-hmm. um for me i've always i've always struggled with balancing the the kind of innate alienness mm-hmm. in a lot of that where sure. elves can live for like 500 years yeah and mostly people play them as just sexy humans yes. which like <laughs> hey again absolutely i'm so on board with it (laughs) totally cool but i do love it when people take that extra step and be like okay so my lifespan is 30 years yes oh and so here's how that changes things yeah um or whatever it ends up being Mm -hmm. um and i think you did it very interestingly with checkers Mm -hmm. um and it is a very holistic way and Mm -hmm. it feeds into a lot of stuff so i'd love to hear how you took your mechanical concept Mm -hmm. and layered it kept layering frog on top yeah, until right. you got checkers. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it is, it is really like that. Like originally the character concept was very different and it took a lot of time, a lot of energy to get it to this point, this specific situation where it's like, ah, checkers, the character has come out and has, yes. has done the things that he decides to do. So I think kind of there are, how do I even start this? Because there's just so many different pieces to it. But I think the easiest yeah. way to explain this is like there, the trope of, weird kind of not in society thief is very out there like you know leverage is was one of my favorite tv shows and the character parker on there is like literally just i'm a thief i steal things i just i don't understand people sometimes and then you know kind of layering that onto a character that i read in another book i forget exactly what it was but it's like the the gentleman thieves or something like that but there's a character in there that is very agile and nimble and very at odds with the rest of the party sometimes and that everyone has to like keep going to look after her and it's like why did you do this we didn't want you to do this and yeah. she's like but i'm stuck i'm bored i don't want to be here all the time it cl- i mean right. in classic uh right. chaotic yeah. crazy right. uh rogue type yep exactly absolutely. exactly so it's like it's a combination of those two things that are very obviously like here's where i'm kind of drawing these inspirations from and where you can see these elements of checkers in there um and then also layering on top of that is some of that specific Dungeons and Dragons lore of this character originally started as a lizard folk, actually. Right. Yep. And over time, we evolved that into kind of like a, a grung, the the frog person, 
variant. So I took a little bit of the lizard folklore of, oh, hey, they, they are outsiders. They like to eat people. They don't necessarily understand human society very much. And combine that with the grung of they have very short lifespans. And I even turned it down into like, well, Checkers comes from a place that, where the people only live for 20 years. Yeah, right. So it's even faster than normal grung. So just kind of, again, understanding that logical what would these constraints do to That's a true. character? Yeah, if it a character ties into yeah. your your kind of uh, needs to make sense. Yeah, it kind needs of to make sense to me. Like if my character only lived for twenty years, what would I what what would they want? What would they enjoy doing? What yeah. would they spend their time doing because they don't have so much of it? So that I think is kind of another place where checkers is coming from. And on top of the, I want to be thieving things. I want to be chaotic things. I want to be my own. <laughs> I want to be chaotic yeah. things. I love that. <laughs> yeah. I just want to be myself in this yeah. world and do the things that I want to do. And it's coming from all these different places and different uh, sort of backgrounds. But I think that's kind of where I'm 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 coming from with checkers. And and how do you balance? This is inherently a character that is is potentially tough to yeah. play in a group right uh -huh. in a group setting where yeah. where you know it, the the easy version is just like well we all just play people who just want to be heroes and and want to you yeah. know kumbaya together yeah uh and and genuinely i mean i think we all like playing that <laughs> as a default yeah, and that right. helps and uh -huh. there's definitely that at the table mm -hmm. which i'm here for like mm -hmm. i love it just nope let's all be friends yeah um but but i also when you were pitching this to me i definitely trusted you mm -hmm. to ensure that checkers was a still along for the ride right and still was going to be present and that you would find motivations for him and, uh -huh. and i would try to meet you halfway as much as sure, possible sure um and also that you would uh as much as we like to meme the frogs on twitter <laughs> uh and as much as people like yeah. also memeing yeah. frogs back at us on twitter uh, -huh. uh that that we were trying to be very intentional of not creating a mascot character yeah. right is right. that we wanted we still wanted checkers to be a real thing uh -huh. and it wasn't just there for frog memes so so how how did you um how did you how, how do you now actively because uh -huh. we're, we're having to do it yeah. obviously at the table uh -huh. how do you take a character like checkers uh -huh. who sometimes does not see value in rescuing people oh yeah and right. and yeah. does you know is like ah well maybe you shouldn't have gotten yourself in that situation mm -hmm. and and occasionally some despicable opinions yeah. <laughs> and also just a lot of alien opinions yeah, sometimes right. or like, selfish opinions and, yeah. and all of these things mm -hmm. how do you marry that with a just being likable at the table uh -huh. in front of your other players but right. also of being a participant in the adventure right i think to that point the first thing i think about is sometimes it's just fun to kind of be that thing that people react to. Yeah. So like with, you know, Kaskrid and Checkers, Checkers is a very strange, has very strange opinions sometimes, but it's interesting to see how that brings out Kaskrid's opinion. Absolutely. Instead of just everyone kind of like, oh yes, of course we want to save the people. But it's like, but why do you want to save the people? Because I don't, <laughs> I, I don't, don't want to do save that. the people. <laughs> so like, why do you care so much? And having them sort of build on their character like that. Um, I think the other part of it is like, I've run enough games and I've, seen yeah. this happen a lot enough times to the point where I feel like I generally know how to play a character that is at odds with the party, but is still very much with the party. Yeah. It's like those classic, like you can play an evil character as long as you all have the same goals and yeah. aren't, aren't actively trying to screw the, the play people at the table over. Right? And, and your end. And, and I think you also do a very good job of actively finding reasons yeah. to be involved. And, right. and obviously again, I as DM want to make sure that there are, mm -hmm. are plenty. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but I think you take a lot of the burden yeah. on yourself, uh, just because you know, you can and right. like, yeah, I know I made this character <laughs> yeah. so I could do these things, yeah. but I'm also here to play. Right. Yeah. I'm not here <laughs> to sit out because my character doesn't think they would do that. It's like, no, yeah. they'll find a reason. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think you always do a great job of, of uh -huh. doing that too. Yeah. Um, which I, I am super thumbs up on. And, and I think, that uh, what you just said mm -hmm. is why I am also so impressed with you as DM and mm -hmm. as a player is you are a player and, and player in the kind of the grand sense where that mm -hmm. encompasses all roles of <laughs> sure. at the at the TTRPG table. Yeah. Um, who you you always feel like you're very present. Mm -hmm. You're you're you know, you're active, you're paying attention, you're ready to give and take spotlight. Mm -hmm. um, but also you are always operating at that kind of bird's eye view. Mm -hmm. I feel like mm -hmm. um, you are always someone who is ready to to do exactly that. To jump yeah. in and be like, "I will be your foil." Yeah, right. You tell me. <laughs> right. You tell me. You you shine uh -huh. by telling my dumb character yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what this is. Right. And and also like, oh, okay, hold on. 
my character reacts to this this way uh-huh. because it's interesting. Yeah. And or and that that applies to combats, mm-hmm. that applies to general storytelling arcs. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you do a great job of that. And I, I do think, like you said, I think that's why Checkers works is yeah, because exactly. you're you're using him as a tool. Yeah. In a lot of senses. Right. Whilst again, while still being a present player. Yeah. Right. Uh, all at the same time. Exactly. Exactly. And I think this is a good example because again, like I don't typically play this kind of character and I don't typically run these kind of NPCs, yes, but no, for some reason, and I suppose there's been a lot of planning and forethought that went into it, but checkers has just kind of worked out. Well, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Really, he really has. He, there was a specific flavor yeah, <laughs> and there's a lot of wrong flavors yeah, re- yeah. right adjacent <laughs> to that flavor. But yeah. so far, so good. Yeah. Yeah. We have made it thus far and I think that's been good, but yes. you know, I'm always willing to just say like, oh, hey, if this specific thing that Checkers is doing doesn't work, we can workshop it. We can change it. I'm not I'm not here to play my character at the expense of other people's characters. Yeah, exactly. So, um, well, I, I uh, you know, as we're kind of winding down, mm-hmm. uh, there's a couple of questions that I regardless of kind of what people are are here for, sure. whether they're designers, whether they're writers, whether mm-hmm. they're whatever's mm-hmm. players. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I want to try and ask everyone is about their kind of emotional connection to tabletops Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or tabletop role-playing games right uh because that's the great part right about Mm -hmm. uh, one of the great parts about the about the genre is that Uh is that it's stories told as a group that you have investment in that you have control over right and so i was just wondering is there a particular moment Uh in your tabletop career yeah uh, as as it is sure um that that you remember as being particularly meaningful uh-huh. or emotional and it doesn't need to be sad it doesn't need yeah. to be joyous it can be just like holy <laughs> shit we killed that boss yeah and that's great or my players did this thing or whatever uh-huh. but is there anything that to you really stands out as like i will remember this yeah as a real thing that happened to me right <laughs> forever uh-huh. yeah uh, there's one thing that comes to mind and i think that was kind of when we i started personally transitioning a little bit more from my character has to have all the power and has to be unstoppable and cannot ever lose in any situation. (laughs) I think that's when I started kind of moving away from that in that I, a friend of mine had invited my brother and I to go play in his campaign for Mm -hmm. a little bit and they were all 15th level and this was a Pathfinder campaign. So my brother and I, we leveled our sort of current Pathfinder characters up to level 15 which for me meant leveling my wizard cleric, yeah. you know, multi-class <laughs> thing to level 15 to the point where I had all these spells, all these powers. And I spent a lot of time figuring out what all the spells I could use in this world were and how I could use them in a way that would make my character, you know, practically unstoppable. Yeah. And it was all dumb stuff like, <laughs> oh, I had a simulacrum of this other kind of monster that could help me re-roll things, you know, a thousand times a day. So I never failed any rolls. And I had this other character that like just acted as like an HP battery. And this was essentially like my wizard had like four other retainers with them that just gave them all kinds of power. And it was just, it spent so much time and it was very ridiculous. And eventually we ended up in a situation where we had this like, you know, PVP tournament arc sort of thing. And it was my wizard versus, you know, two of the other parties with, uh, you know, My brother was also playing in this situation. And both of us had spent so much time doing all this nonsense that we just completely dominated the other side for, you know, and it was, it was just kind of silly because they would ask us like, (laughs) Hey, what are you doing in this situation? I'm like, Oh, I have these 30 spells, which mean you can't touch me. And my brother has plus 70 to his attack roll. So he (laughs) he can never miss, miss, and you're all just dead. And there's nothing you can do about it. Very, uh, very like little kids playing with spaceships. Right. Exactly. It's just like, no, sorry. I have a force field. You didn't, you missed me. Right. Sorry. Yeah. But mine was like, I have a force field and these are the rules that support my force field. Yeah. So you're just dead. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, I'm sorry. Your level 15 archer can't touch me, but that's them's the breaks. Right. And it was those situations like afterwards, kind of reflecting on that it was like why did i do that <laughs> why oh, did that's I, interesting yeah why did i feel the need to just like spend all these time spend all these hours and hours and hours building this character to win at something that ultimately kind of fractured the campaign a little bit because yeah. after that point it was like well the two of you are unstoppable there's nothing i can do to, to make this interesting anymore we're gonna go do something else and at that campaign was just like oh you're right Having more power does not mean having more fun. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it does not help anyone or including myself to be the unstoppable God wizard and just like wreck everything and push over everyone's toys. Yeah. So yeah. it's like that was kind of the moment where I realized, you know, I could actually just play a character that has weaknesses and be OK with that. <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, as long as they're an interesting person, they don't have to be the best at everything. 
So that kind of led to my eventual decline of, well, I don't have to win everything all the time. And it's okay for me to have a weaknesses and can't do everything. There's still a lot of elements of that. Like, right, right. Absolutely. Like, I mean, you, you know. still, you're still definitely someone who enjoys, you know, mecha- the mechanical side of things. Right. You enjoy, you know, theory crafting. Right. You enjoy, you know, finding cool magic items, right. all that kind of stuff. Right, certainly. Exactly. But I'm much more tempered by that experience of, Let's just make sure everyone, myself and everyone at the table has a good time. And that is victory. That is success. Not, oh, I just win because my character is a god wizard. That is that is fascinating yeah. to me that mm-hmm. that um, that that a of that 100 percent tracks with my experience <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. with, with David and Jonathan yep. as players. Yep. Um, and in in good ways. Yeah. Um, and also that is so striking to me and i hope that that you realize mm-hmm. how striking that is where for you mm-hmm. your big emotional ttrpg moment was yeah. off the table yeah right. where it was you know a sense of loss or or yeah. kind of whatever the appropriate words are mm-hmm. and and that feels very very a little sad but also very significant yeah. and very empathetic in a way that i hope um that I hope you are able to feel good about. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know, and in a way, in a way that you can be like, wow, that was, Im- that was important mm-hmm. and is meaningful, yeah. I think, right. uh, and is meaningful to me to hear. And that's really cool. Mm-hmm. And is just like admirable mm-hmm. um, to be able to have that level of self-reflection yeah. uh, and to actually then change yeah, <laughs> based exactly. off of it. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Is really incredible. Um, so uh, to wrap up, mm-hmm. What I want to I want to do, and I'm not saying all these questions are going to make it in, sure, or that these won't change. Sure, um, I love. Uh-huh. I don't know if you ever watched Inside the Actor Studio. Did you uh, ever watch that? I've never seen that. No. It was hosted. Uh, some super fan is going to crucify me. I'm sure for getting things wrong. Uh, it was hosted by an actor named named James Lipton, hmm. uh, who I don't think he worked all that much, but he was big <laughs> in the Screen Actors Guild. Sure. Um, I think maybe he was in charge of it or something like that. But mm-hmm. essentially, he had a, a TV show mm-hmm. where he would have one on one interviews with actors, sure. and they'd be big actors Mm -hmm. um and he would he would have all these like he would be meticulously researched Mm -hmm. he would ask them about like so in your childhood home (laughs) there was one loose squeaky floorboard and he's like and the people would be like how (laughs) did you you know that were you just watching me this whole time as i grew up it's like i wasn't in my book or any what did you do and he would never reveal it and it was always wonderful and always (laughs) mysterious and i genuinely think that was a big part of why i loved interviewing people so awesome um but he would end every show Mm -hmm. asking people the same question that were like distills a lot about a person and it's like interesting i i used i've kind of repurposed a couple of them but you know kind of the classic ones are like what's your favorite sound what's your least (laughs) favorite sound what's your favorite curse word Uh um and just very snappy very quick you know like if 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 you die Uh and heaven and god turns out to be real what do you want him to say to you when you get there sure um and again all 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 small things Uh but things that that still tell you a lot about the person interesting um and i have uh, assembled a couple if you want to talk more about any of them uh-huh. do it okay but also if you're just like yes <laughs> great 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 don't worry about it yeah um my ideal would then to just essentially be able to look at all of the spectrum of all the people we've ever interviewed right now that we're, we've had this oh hello beautiful patients yep. mm-hmm. it's me your dungeon master nathan oh yeah spin off tv shows yeah. whatever we have our own panel at gen con exactly like, yeah, uh-huh. um but to be able to look at these questions and be like ah jonathan <laughs> said it this said this and then this other person said this mm-hmm. and like just be able to kind of like have a shared almost experience yeah um, in exploring these questions. I think it'll be really interesting too once we do my brother's interview of how yes. our, how our answers are similar or different. <laughs> yes, and, and and the whole the whole cast too of yeah. like what, you know, um what everyone says and what that says about us and mm-hmm. then about other creators and like, ooh, do all creators share this? Yeah, yeah. Um so it'll be it'll be interesting. And again, they might change over time. Mm-hmm. Um I might cut a few here and there. I don't know. But sure. uh so for a trial run, our lightning round yeah. question, uh-huh. I'm sure I'll come up with a fun, snazzy uh branding name one day. But yeah. are you a person who is a glass half full or half empty person? Uh half empty, I think. Okay. What excites you? creatively it can be creatively it can be spiritually it can be emotionally it can be things that you experience in life but what what excites you what just really more than anything gets you going oh what excites me 
I think challenges or mm-hmm. cool, interesting things. That, that's not a, a really great answer, but I'm mm. just thinking like, no, all I, it, uh, if it is a yeah. true answer, it yeah. is a great answer. Yeah. Like I, I really get, I really enjoy in the D and D space, like making new characters and like coming up with n- new cool things to do or, um, you yeah, know, when I'm running campaigns, it's like, I, I like presenting cool and interesting challenges to the players that are kind of outside of what they've typically seen before. Like I ran a monster that was just immune to magic damage and, um, the players had to, every time they hit it with magic damage, it would just reflect it back on them and they would take damage and die. So it was like, okay, cool. How do you deal with this thing that is very clearly tailored to just beat you? <laughs> you know, what is it? What are the, what are the backup options? What are the second backup options and third backup options that you've thought about or haven't thought about? Because this thing's going to murder you if you just try to keep hitting it with your ba- with your magic weapons. Um, so just stuff, some things like that, I think, are interesting and mm-hmm. cool and creative for myself. What does not excite you in that way? What is the opposite? What drains you even? Uh, things that drain me. Probably n- people. I don't want to say this like a people telling me that like my stuff's not good or yeah. like presenting like ne- negative feedback in a way. It's like. I, I'm good enough at telling myself that my stuff's not that good. <laughs> I don't need other people doing yeah, it. Especially in a, in a truly negative yeah, way. Yeah, right. That makes sense. Right, exactly. So what is your favorite sound? Uh, and it can be any sound. What sound brings you the most comfort, the most joy, the most serenity? Uh, what sound brings me joy and comfort? I like the ocean. I think mm-hmm. the sound of ocean waves is, is a big one. Mm-hmm. That and rain. I think yeah. I'm a big like water person in general, so um, those are always calming and soothing. What sound do you hate? Um, I feel like the obvious one is like you know nails on a chalkboard sort of thing, like screeching. But it's terrible for a reason. Yeah. I think <laughs> it's a cliche for a reason. I think the sound that I hate is like an angry argument. Mm-hmm. I'm just not a fan of that. Yep. What's your favorite word to use, to say, to read, to hear? Uh, what's my favorite word? Do I have a favorite word? I'm going to say scrumptious. Ooh, scrumptious. that's a good one. Scrumptious is a good word. If only because I like food and tasty food is good. So scrumptious is going to be my word. That's a great one. Yeah. Uh, what is your least favorite word? Are you a person <laughs> who's like, can't hear moist? <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually, I don't mind moist. Um, no, me either. M- moist is a fine word. Um, foible is always a fine word too. Like the, the <laughs> OIs, I'm just like, okay, cool, whatever. Those are words. Um, what's my least favorite word though? Um I don't have a good answer for that. No worries. We'll yeah. skip it. Yeah. We'll think, s- ponder. We'll edit it in later. Yeah. Maybe I'll come up with something. Uh, what tabletop role playing game or D and D monster mm-hmm. have you not faced or run that you would love to? I on Reddit, I always see these threads about people running the false Hydra oh, encounter yeah. of just like this monster who slowly eats your memories until you forget about things, and then you know turns out and eats all of you. And I've always wanted to try something like that because one, everyone just seems to like see that false Hydra as like a really cool encounter and yeah. everyone just wants to run it. So yeah, I might, I, that's something that I think would be cool to do of how do I do this encounter mm-hmm. and how do I run it correctly? You know, cause it, it has a very specific set of abilities and it, there's sort of a way that the encounters are supposed to go. So I want to, I would want to make sure that I would run that successfully and correctly so that my players could get the full feel yeah. of the false Hydra. What is your favorite adventure of all time? Uh, it can be, again, one that you read, one that you have run, or one that you've run, one that you've played uh-huh. in, uh, anything. Yeah, so my favorite adventure is probably one that I tried to run and didn't quite turn out the way I wanted it to, but I spent a lot of time on it, so I'm I'm kind of attached to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I honestly cannot remember the name of it because it was this third-party, like, huge long epic encounter or like campaign thing that i started running for you know a group of people and then we never really got that far in it but it was like a big epic sandbox called the desolation or something and it was it was like a hex crawl you know you would go into different parts of the world and fight these monsters and try to find another thing and you had to you know run around at all these milestones and then after you ran around the sandbox for a while and collected all the things that you were supposed to collect, there was a whole separate section for, okay, you infiltrate this big castle. And it was a very like old school D and D kind of thing where you could just walk through a door and the door was secretly a portal to another plane and the, the door closed and ha, huh, now you're stuck in another plane. <laughs> yeah. You're dead. Good luck. So that, I remember that campaign again. I don't remember the details of it, but I remember running it and it was just, it was cool because it was so grand. It was so massive and it was yeah. just like this pure hex crawl that players just kind of had to find their way through 
and just the world in it and the level of detail in everything that they put together in that campaign was just on a different scale than something that I had been used to before, which is mostly just like Pathfinder Society modules. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so that was cool. What's your favorite TTRPG character of all time? Right now, it's Checkers. If only because he's just so different from anything that I've done. And I'm just very impressed at how he's turned out and how hopefully he will continue to turn out. But also because uh, he's a frog boy and everyone seems to like that. So like, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me like it. Cool. Yeah, right. Last question. Mm-hmm. What gives you hope? Oh, boy. Uh, what does give me hope? My friends, probably. Yeah. Friends are good. Mm-hmm. It's important friends to have friends. Like people who like genuinely get you and are willing to be like, hey, let's hang out or I'll stick up for you or I'll listen to you. I think it's important to have those kinds of people in your life, um, which is why I like hanging out with everyone here so much, because I feel like every single one of these people is that person for me or could be that person for me. So friends are good. Keep having them. If you don't have friends, please find more friends. <laughs> we'll be your friends. Yeah, right. We'll be your friends. Come hang out. Well, Jonathan, thank you for joining Thanks, on this inaugural, I guess, sort of uh, inaugural interview series. I have been your host, Nathan Lurs. Tune in next time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.